Chapter 2, Part 4, Population Distribution Graphs. When population is small, scores for each member are used to make a histogram. However, when populations are large, which most are populations that we'll be interested in studying are quite large, scores for each member are not possible. Um, therefore, graphs based are based on relative frequency. So instead of showing frequency on the ordinate here, in our x values here, we represent relative frequency. And just as a reminder, relative frequency is equal to frequency over n, and it produces a proportion. So if you are given a graph and the ordinate is represented by decimals, then you are looking at relative frequency. It's a proportion. Um, and so we're going to demonstrate the data using relative frequency opposed to exact frequency because it's very unlikely that we would have data for all population members. So we're going to use the proportion of those values given a sample that we've um, assessed. And, and uh, we'll encounter this word normal quite a bit, especially when we engage in probability. So normal refers to a symmetrical distribution um, with the greatest frequency in the middle of the distribution. And this is a very common um, structure for many of the variables that we'll be interested in. And, and normal distributions apply to anything that grows in nature. So it's normally distributed. So the size of an apple, the size of a kid, um, the weight of an adult female is usually normally distributed um, where the highest frequency is in, at the center of the average of those values. Um, I think I skipped this point of the graphs are, um, use smooth curves to indicate exact scores um, were not used. So we'll see an illustration of that in just a second. So here's an example. Let's say we want to assess uh, the types of fish in a particular um, lake. And um, so again, the type of fish, what kind of scale of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Hopefully you said nominal because it's just a named category and we can't rank it um, objectively. So um, we have the, the scale of measurement demonstrated on the abscissa. And instead of frequency, we have relative frequency. So again, the proportion of this type of fish that was recorded. So again, these would be proportions. Um, relative frequency is equal to frequency over n. Okay, so just to make sure you understand that if you have proportions on the ordinate, we're using relative frequency because we don't have the exact values for the entire population. And IQ population distribution is a very common um, variable that we will use for examples in this class. So instead of um, denoting the exact frequency, where we use relative frequency. And here are x value, the actual IQ scores. And question, what scale of measurement are IQ scores? Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? Hopefully you said interval. Again, interval exists for very specific um, types of variables. And IQ scores or any standardized um, test score is included in the interval scale of measurement because it's absent of a meaningful zero. Um, in fact, for IQ scores, it's not even a possible score. So it prevents it from being ratio scale of measurement. And it's not ordinal because it is numeric. Ordinal is not a numeric score. So just again, a refresher of the different characteristics of the scales of measurement. So IQ scores and all standardized test scores are considered interval. So we have those demonstrated on the abscissa and then the relative frequency. And this is the smooth curve that we were talking about that demonstrates that we don't have exact frequency, but we're basing it on proportions. Um, and the highest frequency here in the center is denoted by the average um, IQ of a population, which is 100. And um, just as a little preview of what's to come in chapter four, we'll talk about standard deviation, which is lowercase Greek sigma. In this case, for IQ scores is equal to 15. So one standard deviation unit, which, by the way, standard deviation is um, the average difference between scores and the mean of a distribution. 
So we'll use it as a descriptive statistic, and we'll talk much more about that as we progress through the chapters. But I thought since this is a very typical example, I'd show you that. So again, one standard deviation unit above would take us to an IQ of 115. One standard deviation unit below would take us to an IQ score of 85. So just a little preview of things to come when we start talking about averages and standard deviation. Um, here's an illustration of the consequences of misusing graphs. And so here we're using, we're actually using the exact same data. And uh, remember I, I had mentioned a, a certain proportion um, or ratio of the abscissa to the um, ordinate of how data is demonstrated or displayed. And so we have the years here and number of um, homicides um, are denoted on the ordinate. Now, by looking at this top graph, we see that um, 2008 had much higher homicides um, reported than the graph below. The graph below, notice that these numbers are kind of um, in larger increments. And so what that has done visually is kind of squashed the data and visually, it's kind of hard to see any distinction. So it appears as though all of these years, the number of homicides are pretty equal to one another. But it's a function of the fact that the space between these intervals is quite large opposed to here. Here we're moving in increments of two, right? And here we're moving in increments of 20. So you have to be conscientious of that and, and recognize that the visual um, illustration of the data may convey something very different if you're not paying attention. So for example, let's say um, um, chief of police is touting their record while they're um, holding that particular position and um, they, they present in a presentation this graph and it shows um, visually you may be led to believe that there really hasn't been any change which he may say or she may say is, is good um, but the top graph um, would show that let's say this person was in um, that position from 05 to 08 and we see an increase in homicides and the graph illustrates that dramatically so just be conscientious of that. Always um, take note of the increments that are being used on the abscissa and the ordinate so that you aren't misled by the presentation, the visual presentation of information. One of the objectives of this class is to ensure that you are a, a critical consumer of information, which will lead you to be a good citizen of our um, country because you will assess things um, more analytically and critically to make better conclusions um, than someone who's never taken a statistics course an intro class to stats. All right, so frequency distribution shape. If we're talking about the normal distribution, there's some things that we should take into consideration and characteristics of a distribution. So researchers describe a distribution shape in words rather than drawing it. Symmetrical distribution, meaning that we have a symmetrical distribution if we split in half. Um, what we see above that center line is equal to um, anything below. So there, it's a mirror image above and below. So that would be considered a normal distribution, also referred to as symmetrical. Skewed, right? Skewed means that it's not um, symmetrical. And we have two different types of um, skew, positive and negative. So scores pile up on one side and taper off in the tail. So if it's a normal distribution, we, we say it has two tails. So the frequency tapers off as we increase in values this way, and it tapers off as we decrease in values that way. And the center is represented by the average. But when a distribution is skewed, all right, it's not symmetrical, the visual looks a slightly different. So here we have um, a normal distribution up here. And this is what we refer to as positively skewed. So again, this is frequency. This is our X, frequency and X. So 
if it's positively skewed, that is defined as this idea that the tail, the tail of the distribution, first of all, it only has one tail if it's skewed. And the tail is on the positive side. Um, so if we have this as zero, so the tail is pointing to the positive, whereas here, again, this is zero, the tail here is pointing to the negative. Um, and other characteristics positively skewed, the higher frequency, right, is denoted by lower numbers. So let me just make up numbers here and say this is one, two, three, four, five. So the highest frequency based on what I've just drawn here is equal to three. So the higher frequency is denoted by the lower x values for positively skewed distribution. For negatively skewed distribution, we have the highest frequency. Again, if we do one, two, three, four, and five, we have the highest frequency denoted by a larger x value. So, so here, it's piled up higher above four, and the tail is pointing to the negative side of it, the distribution. So we won't always have um, symmetrical distributions, but as we get into probability, we will only be working with symmetrical distributions, but we need to consider that some distributions may be skewed. Let me erase this for just a second um, to ask you some questions. So if I were to say again, if this is frequency, in x values, x values, frequency. If I were to say these distributions um, illustrate the scores on exam one, which graph would you say um, demonstrates that the test was very easy? The test was very easy. Would it be a positively skewed distribution or negatively skewed distribution? So again, that the, the exam was very easy. If it's very easy, then you would imagine that many individuals would score high scores opposed to many individuals scoring low scores. So if I said the exam was very easy, this negatively skewed distribution would be the best illustration. Again, these are the lower scores down here. These are the higher scores increase as we move to the right. The frequency here denoting that many students scored high scores, right? So either they're very well prepared or the exam was very easy. If the exam is very difficult, right, very difficult, and we have lower scores here and scores increase this way, the higher frequency denoted by lower scores, meaning more students scored low scores versus these scores down here, higher scores have a lesser frequency. So this would illustrate that a, an assessment was very difficult. Very few students um, scored high. And this distribution, a normal distribution, would illustrate that I would say an exam is very fair. And so we have the highest frequency in the center, let's say a C grade. We have fewer students scoring at the A, B, and A level, and few students at the D and um, excuse me, D and F level. This is the type of distribution I want on all of my assessments. Um, the majority in the center, with few distinguishing themselves as being above average, and hopefully very few distinguishing themselves as being below average. Um, so, other things that I want to point out is. Um, this idea of modes, and we'll talk a lot about, more about that in chapter two, but a little precursor mode is, is um, an illustration of the highest frequency. So if we have one mode, we would only see one hump, right? The highest frequency here and here and here. But here, here we have a distribution where we have two humps and that would be considered um, bimodal. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the next chapter. So we have two values that had um, the highest frequency. All right, so again, um, we'll have to distinguish between positively skewed and negatively skewed. And that concludes the lecture for Chapter 2, Frequency Distributions.
and uh, I will start working on chapter three and get those posted as soon as possible.